All right, we should be recording. So we're just going to set up the GitLab Silver top level group with uh, SSO on Azure and then uh, hopefully with Skim as well. So we're in Azure now. <coughs> And basically, we're just following the, the normal SAML SSO for groups documentation along with the Azure specific documentation for setting up the SAML SSO application, which is this. And we'll also be using the skim documentation on our end. Uh, so, first, everything has to be you have to actually create an application uh, in Azure. Um, there's no default application, or there's no built in application for GitLab, so we need to create our own. <clears throat> And we already have a few, but we're going to create a fresh one. So there's nothing in the gallery, so we need to create our own. We'll call it GitLab Silver. And then we'll wait a while. like a while, a while. Okay. Okay, so we have our application. So the first thing we need to do is actually switch it over to be a SAML based application. So we'll do that on the single sign on tab. That's all done. <clears throat> and now there's only two. Uh, well, there's three things. Uh, we don't document the third thing, but there's three fields we need to fill out here. Two are required and one is optional, but we should be filling it out and that's the sign on URL. Um, so these two we're going to get from the settings page in our actual group. So we're in GitLab Silver right now and uh, let's see where that can't remember which one is which yeah this is this one so we'll just edit this fill in our reply URL and fill in our identifier okay No, we don't need to test right now. Uh, and then let's see. <clears throat> yeah, okay, yeah, this is where the documentation differs a little bit. So we need to give the login URL, no, we need to provide the login URL and the fingerprint for the certificate, or the, yeah, fingerprint for the certificate into GitLab, which is actually, if I remember correctly, down here. This is our login URL, so we're gonna fill this out. And the certificate thumbprint is here. And then we'll save that, I believe. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, I think we could save. We need to configure something else in Azure first, but I believe we can save this for now in GitLab. Yeah. And this part, Cynthia, I don't exactly remember. I know we had a problem with this step. Um, when was that in here? Okay, we need to, so under that the- That was this, right? Yes. Yeah, and that's right. Attributes. Yeah. Um, you have to edit the, at the top. Yeah, that's right. Identifier value, so. And that needs to go to object ID. Um, you know, I'm. I don't exactly I believe remember. Object ID. Um, for what's odd is that like it doesn't actually tell you in the documentation where yeah. it actually tells you the documentation is the skim uh, docs. Um, right. And yeah, that was one of the issues we identified. Yeah. It tells you to use object ID. Okay, so it is object ID? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, and then we left email address, that's fine. as the identifier format, okay. And now we need to map, 
configure the assertions. Uh, weren't these already configured? I think these are already done. I uh, know. Didn't we need you, to not do anything with this for basic SAML? So for basic SAML, um, if you go to Azure, like just go to uh, the first row, for example, um, of the user attributes. Yeah. Um, you'll see that there are some differences and you actually have to edit them in order to make sure that they match the table that we have mm -hmm. uh, in our docs. Why is this not loading? That I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So go back to oh, user attributes. Yeah. Um, edit that. Um, That's right. So um, like the first one, uh, if you click on it, um, <clears throat> uh, no, the source is right. So what yeah, we need to that's do correct. is um, our key, which is the name. So that should either be email or mail according to our table. Oh, I see. Oh, the name needs yeah, to be you, email or mail. Yes, the yeah. name need, needs to match yeah, what is listed as a supported key on our docs. Yeah. Okay. And then you want to make sure that the other ones match yeah. our table as well. Yeah, given name should be first name. So this should be, yeah, so it maps to given names. So this should be one of those. Yeah, be, it doesn't matter which one. I yeah. tend to use the one with without, but just all lowercase without the underscore. Yeah, that's, that's better, yeah. Then we'll configure surname. Uh, and name, I guess, is full name. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and that's uh, that's the same. It's just name. No, that's right. Yeah, that one doesn't. Change. Yep. Okay. So that's the part that's kind of, I guess, like y you kind of really have to know your identity provider to know exactly where you're mapping these values, um, and that's yep. kind of where like our docs could be a little bit better to at least tell you, hey, in Azure, it's in the user attributes and claim section, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, that's the reason, because it's. I know it's definitely different in Okta, so that's why I was, I was saying we should probably do uh, a specific doc for each provider, just because it, it just takes all the guesswork out of this. Um, and that should be it for basic SSO, as far as I'm aware. We already authorized it, so... That's all done. Can we do this? Yeah, this should take us to, the, yeah, okay, that works fine. So I'm already associated with this group, so that won't really do anything. Um, the only other step I think that we didn't mention that I saw James Lopez do in the video was he added the uh, sign on URL here. I think he then mentioned later on in the video it caused an issue if, if this wasn't filled out. Um, and that's basically the, where did I leave that for our old group? I don't know where to grab it. If you go but back to the SAML this. settings page, it's probably a different token. Is it on there? Um, yeah, it's definitely well, in token, GitLab yeah. because we set it up in GitLab Silver. Right. Um, this is a different group, so it would have a where, different token. Where did it go? Well, I guess it went away. Oh, okay. it's. It's oh, it's this, from the it's login. Behind yeah. a sign-in page. Yeah, it's behind the sign-in page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's right here. Yeah, but we keep it without the token for this at least. Is it? That's what he had in the video. Yeah. Ah, okay. I think it threw an error when it when he had the actual token in it. Yeah. Okay, and that's it as far as basic SAML goes. Um, for adding skim, there's a little bit of a different process. So we need to be going over to provisioning and we can ignore, for gitlab.com at least, we can ignore pretty much everything here up to here. So we first need to generate a skim token and the URL. And this is going to be provided to Azure. So we need to switch our provisioning mode to automatic and we need to give our token and our endpoint URL and we'll give a notification email 
We can test the connection at that point. It should hopefully work. Yep. Save that. Okay. And now the most important part, we need to change our mappings. Um, we don't need to map groups, so we can ignore that, but we need to click on our user mapping settings. Most of this should already be filled out. The documentation, I believe, says these need to be checked, but as far as I know, they always will be by default. Um, this, I think, is another location or another part where our documentation is a little bit lacking because all of these, most of these mappings, some of the values are already taken up by other mappings, so it won't let you use them unless you clear them out first, and you'll kind of see what I mean. Um, so first of all, and we're planning on improving this, uh, first of all, we need to map object ID. Uh, we need to have two mappings for object ID, one that maps it to ID and one that maps it to external ID. Um, so let's see, first of all, we can just do that because I don't think it starts off with any object ID mapping. No, it does not. Um, and nothing is mapped to ID right now either. So we can add a new mapping. It needs to be a direct mapping to object ID. Target attribute needs to be ID. And oh yeah, okay, so here's actually one of the conflicts. So there's a matching precedent set by default on user principal name mapped to username to one, and we can't have more than one matching precedent. So what we can actually do first before we add that new mapping is we can edit this mapping and we can change, I believe last time I got an error if I didn't match anything to it, let's see. Yeah, okay, there always has to be one. So what we'll do is we'll map it to two temporarily. And then we'll refresh because I spent an hour yesterday trying to figure out why it wouldn't let me map something to one, but it's because I hadn't refreshed for some reason. <clears throat> okay, we'll open up our mappings again. The group section may or may not disappear. We'll see if it, no, it didn't. It will eventually though, I think. Okay, user principal name is still set to one for some reason. Oh, did I forget to save it? Yeah, I think I did. <laughs> yes, I definitely did. Okay, let's just, let's just try it and see if it actually works without a refresh. So we'll do, uh, what are we doing here? Object ID. To ID with a matching precedence of one. Okay, nice. And actually, let me add it. Uh, and now we're going to do another one, except here. See, we need to map it to external ID as well, except external ID is already set to mail nickname. Uh, and I believe we don't, yeah, that's changed to username. Yeah, and as a part of that, see, mail nickname. Yeah, we change that to username eventually, anyway, in the next step. So really those steps should kind of be reversed. Let's see, username is already, oh my God, see this is like a mess because username is already taken by user principal name. So we can just, let's see. Yeah. I think user principal name is number the third one that we have. Yeah. Uh, we mapped to Emails type? It needs to be mapped to emails, which is already taken by mail. Oh. Yeah, see. So I think, uh, but mail is not actually, oh yeah, I think this is what I did. I just deleted this because we don't actually need mail. Yeah, mail doesn't show up at least in our base configuration. So now we should be able to map user principal name to emails and remove the matching precedents. Emails, yeah, and then set that to no. Okay, and now that should allow us to map a uh, mail nickname to username, which will then let us map object ID also to external ID because it frees it up. Username, what a mess.
That's interesting. Can you just type it in? Or is it because you haven't saved it that it hasn't like refreshed possibly. the Possibly, yeah, possibly. Discard that. I think there was a joke this morning about how if you uh, refresh it enough times, it'll just work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about yeah, and then see, and it's right. There you go. All you got to do is refresh a couple times. No big deal, you know. Yeah, it's, it's good. That's good user flow. All right, and now I think all we have left is: do we have mail nickname to username? Yes, we do. We have object ID to ID matching precedence one and object ID to external ID and user principal name is Mac emails. And all three of these actions are checked. Looks good, right? Yeah, looks pretty good. We'll save that before we edit the uh, attribute list. Okay. And now finally, we need to go down and show advanced options. And we need to click edit attribute list for our app. And we need to make sure that only two checkboxes are checked. Yeah, this one will always be checked. So we need to, according to the docs, make sure that ID is the only one as the primary key and is the only field that's required. So we'll uncheck this. And we'll save, make sure none others are there. Yep, save it. This happened to be last time it erred and then I did it again and it just worked for some reason. Let's see if that happens again. All right. And, uh, and then all we have to do is turn provisioning on and that will start to provision users, update users and delete users on an interval. So we just need to, uh, and also most users, we don't mention this except in a note, um, the default is that it will only sync users and groups that are added specifically to your application. So the GitLab Silver as a SAML application that we created. Um, this option will sync users that are added to your Azure portal overall uh, and ones that are added just to your application. We're gonna assume and probably recommend that users just leave it at the default, but it kind of works the same way no matter what option you have. It shouldn't really affect anything as far as provisioning goes. So we'll just leave it at the default and then we wanna turn it on. Save the changes. And that should pretty much be it. So if we go in, I believe now we can just add a user to this application. Although if I remember right, we now need to Oh yeah, isn't the case that you need, if in order for a user to show up in the application, you need to have created them in the portal anyway? Because like these are all the only users that are here are ones we've created in the portal. So I guess we might as well just make a new user in the portal itself. Yeah, so it kind of depends. Like often people are using their provider for a lot of different apps and um, you don't necessarily want everyone in your um, Active Directory to have access to all the apps, right? Which is why you can scope it um, right. to either the ones um, specifically added to uh, <laughs> um, 
Oh, oh that's you're, right. You need to get my copy. stupid long yeah. URL. Just just copy it from another user. Yeah. That's what I do. Um, for anyone watching the recording, basically when you create a, a uh, Azure account on Microsoft Cloud, you by default are assigned a URL that's based on the Microsoft account you associated with that portal. And in my case, it's associated with my Gmail account. So I get this super ridiculous looking Gmail Microsoft hybrid thing, domain. So that's what we have to use. Although most um, companies, for example, will <coughs> have their own custom domains set up. Right. I'm gonna throw this in the chat, just in case we need it. Create the user. We will. <laughs> Definitely. And now we'll head back to our application. And this user should be available to add to that application because we've now created it in Azure. <clears throat> Give him a standard user role. And now he's been added. So now, theoretically, the next time a provisioning cycle comes around, that user should be added in GitLab. And we can view the logs here, which basically will show any event uh, of communication between Azure and GitLab, whether it's to delete a user, update information about a user, add a new user, or do anything else. And we don't have anything yet because no provisioning cycle has gone through yet. Now, we were kind of testing on whether or not you can force this. According to Azure, you can force a provisioning cycle by turning it off and on again. Uh, that seemed to work, maybe when we tried this, and maybe it didn't work, it wasn't really 100% clear, but we can try it just to see. Uh, if you click on the provisioning details, is it is it showing that there was a provisioning cycle? Last completed cycle at 152, I guess was when it was first, uh, Enabled, I'm assuming, is when that was. What about that refresh button there under current status? Yeah, this um, doesn't do a lot. <laughs> okay, well, actually, no, it looks like it did try to work, though. Okay. I'm assuming uh, I keep losing this freaking link, man. All right. I'm assuming this user is not going to be added. Oh, man. <laughs> Not sure if that would be you know, that would that would definitely have shown it. Um, yeah, this is the other thing that you that we ran into yesterday is it'll show that there was an error provisioning, but nothing will be in the logs just yet because obviously it ran into an error. This is yeah, it'll it, it basically what it means by that is it's going to retry whatever action it failed to do on the next cycle. Uh, but I'm not sure why it will not show a log entry for that because it clearly tried to do something. That failed. And did you say well now. what the cycles are? Like every well, it says every forty minutes. Uh, oh. We when we got a user to be added successfully, or to clarify, when we were able to get a user added to our testing group, uh, and that when that user already had a GitLab.com account, we were able to get it to sync to the group in less than forty minutes, and that's I'm pretty sure that's because we turned the provisioning status off and on. Um, and it looks like that probably worked here as well. It's just not showing a log yet for some reason. But what was odd is that when we did the other application, um, which uh, you you can go into if you'd like. Well, I mean, while we're trying to figure out whether the logs will randomly show up on this one, if you if you go back to the GitLab um, app, which is the original one we set up, and if you go to the audit logs, you'll notice there's a there's a huge gap in the audit logs where um, it will show the logs for some things and then like it, there were no logs between something like, um, uh, oh, uh, now there's newer ones. Yeah. These weren't here earlier. 
so if you keep scrolling down though. Oh, so actually even there, that last row, you see it's 347. Mm -hmm. And then um, we actually forced a refresh a couple of times between then and five, but there were no audit logs in between. So it almost seems random when it decides to uh, yeah. have an audit log and when it doesn't. <laughs> I just, I can't figure out when and why sometimes it's missing. Yeah, that is as of yet unknown. Um, I'm very curious to see what the actual error is here, though, because this is a completely fresh setup and we've done everything according to. Okay, the user actually showed up right there in the uh, overview page, so something might have synced. Okay, yeah, we've got something. So, okay, this is the exact same error uh, that we ran into. Uh, on our other application on GitLab 2. And this does differ slightly from the app, the error that users are getting. But I think this, as far as I know, this pretty conclusively shows that this is not working with a base configuration according to the documentation, as far as I can tell. I'm a little curious though, like if we try to uh, log in with that user now, um, and tie it to like